Good morning. I am Didier Blaise from Institut Pauli Calmet uh, in Marseille. And today I will uh, talk with you about the conditioning regimen for acute myeloid leukemia and try to give you some update on this uh, topic. Um, here are my disclosures. Um, conditioning regimen has always been a major issue concerning allogenic transplantation since the early beginning, with finally a triple objective. The first one is to eradicate the disease. The second one too is to avoid graft rejection and to allow for engraftment. And the third one is to not to be harmful for the patient with a tolerable morbidity and without mortality. And from the early beginning, as I said, starting in the uh, late 70s, it has been always a search to find the best and ideal conditioning regimen. And clearly, it doesn't exist. Initially on, it was a TBI-based regimen, and it was no choice. And it was at the time that one regimen fits all patients. And now we have introduced many parameters as a dose of, of a drug we use for conditioning regimen or different kind of drugs. And we have now rather in the paradigm, paradigm that conditioning regimen, one size does not fit all. And we will, I will try to review with you these different uh, aspects. First question that I've been asked is to know if no TBI conditioning regimen are as, le as efficient and less toxic uh, than the one with uh, TBI. Uh, back in the late 80s, we conducted the first uh, clinical trial, prospective clinical trial, uh, comparing to a standard dose of TBI at this time, it was 12 gray uh, in a six fraction, um, oral busulfan over four days. And we randomized 100 patients uh, with uh, CR1 AML with a median age, as you can see, very young at this time, but it was these days of 30 years. And all the patients received uh, unrelated uh, match sibling donor. Uh, transplant. And when you look to the result, and it was an update uh, uh, performed in 2001, so t more than 10 years later, you can see that very clearly TBI at this time, when compared to uh, oral busulfan, and it was oral busulfan in this clinical trial, uh, conduct perhaps to a higher uh, transplant-related mortality, but a better uh, disease uh, protection. And you can see that at the end of the day, overall survival and leukemia-free survival was much better. In fact, this question was addressed again uh, some years ago uh, by two uh, retrospective studies conducted by the CIBMTR and EBMT. And at this time, part of the patient who received busulfan received the new formulation of busulfan, which was IV uh, busulfan. And you can see that more, three, that more than 3,000 patients have been included in these uh, uh, studies, 1,000 nearly, uh, having received uh, uh, IV busulfan. Most of the patients uh, were CR1 AML. The median age was higher than the one in the previous studies, and some patients received a, a, non, um, a, do, a graft from an unrelated uh, donor. Now, when you look to the results, first look to the left side of the uh, slide, uh, you can see that, uh, uh, in fact, when you use IV busulfan, there is a better outcome. It is due to a lower uh, non-relapse mortality and also a lower uh, long-term uh, relapse rate, connecting really to a better leukemia-free survival and overall survival. On the other hand, when you look to the data uh, coming from the EBMT, there is no difference, uh, whatever the status of the disease, CA1 or CA2, between IV busulfan and, uh, uh, and the TBI. But as you remember from the previous slide, it's not exactly the same population, and there is, for example, not much sibling, not unrelated donor in this uh, last uh, study. So I think that the conclusion from these two important studies is the fact that uh, at least uh, IV busulfan based uh, uh, regimen in a myeloablative situation give as good result as TBI and perhaps better result for the long term. 
So the situation and the stage that changed a lot with a new thinking about conditioning regimen. Everything came from the seminal work performed by uh, Ernst Holler. And it was the very first one to show that, in fact, complication post-transplantation was related to the cytotoxicity of the conditioning regimen conducting to the generation of pro-inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines that, in fact, will stimulate the uh, T cell from the donor and conduct to the toxicity. So it's this kind of the work uh, conducted to the innovation of reduced intensity conditioning uh, regimen. At this time, it was not so easy because most of most investigators thought that it would be a real danger concerning the engraftment of uh, uh, the graft and also to uh, lower the antitumoral uh, uh, activity. But uh, Andrea Bagasi Galupo, as you can see on this uh, uh, slide, and you know that very, uh, very well, this kind of schema shows that uh, between non myeloablative regimen that can allow for good engraftment in some situation and the standard myeloablative regimen, there is a room for what has been called at this time reduced intensity conditioning. And basically, over the uh, 25 last years, it has been uh, uh, an area of work very a uh, very intense area of work one of the first question uh, we addressed was to know if the less intensity was the best and in fact we conducted in marseille a prospective randomized uh, trial where we compare uh, standard uh, of the last decade uh, uh, reduced intensity conditioning regimen uh, combining fludarabin uh, PO bisulfan, and remember it was uh, uh, PO, thymoglobulin one day, uh, followed by PBSC from uh, the donor to the standard Frida TBI, non myeloablative regimen, based on two gray uh, TBI. Uh, you can see that uh, we randomized uh, uh, more than 130 patients. All patients received a, a graft from a match uh, sibling. And when, uh, when we looked to the result, very clearly, there was no difference in terms of overall survival and also in terms of leukemia-free survival. Cause of failure was, however, completely different. As you can see, in the situation of flu TBI, uh, there was more relapse. And this indicated very well that the intensity of the conditioning regime has an importance in disease control. The second thing is that in the situation of reduced intensity conditioning regime, it was uh, is there was a higher non-relapse mortality, basically due to severe acute GVHD. For these reasons, uh, we modify our strategy using, in fact, two days of ATG uh, to improve the, uh, the outcome. I will not go through detail, but we showed uh, uh, that, in fact, the fact to uh, introduce more ATG was not associated with a loss, any loss in uh, disease control. So we conducted a phase two study for all the patients because the main goal of this development was really to treat uh, all the patients. And at this time, 55 was already uh, uh, older age. So we treated 75 patients, median age was 60, and they all received much sibling daughter with this conditioning regime. Now, we, if we extract from this uh, uh, panel of patients uh, the CO1 AML or NDS, you can see that for this uh, age and for this kind of approach, the overall survival at three years is 76%, which is uh, very nice and very promising uh, at this time. There was no difference in terms of age, but showing very clearly that even in older age, this kind of approach can be uh, used. And on the top of that, we perform um, quality of life analysis showing that the patient transplanted with this kind, with this, uh, in this uh, age range, uh, express a good quality of life one year after transplantation, whatever the parameter uh, you look. So I come back to this kind of schema. 
as you have understood, we have now the possibility to use different conditioning regimen, and we can even modulate the yellow ablation we want to to uh, to give to the patient. And in fact, these conducted to uh, to change again the paradigm coming from reduce intensity to reduce uh, toxicity uh, uh, regimen. So uh, this was very uh, important in terms of uh, uh, concept, and very uh, clearly uh, we can uh, uh, see that the different possibilities offered to the investigator are uh, very uh, uh, important. So several questions raised. The first one was to know if we are in the situation of a low toxicity conditioning regimen with yellow ablation, have we as good as uh, in the situation on reduced intensity conditioning. So we retrospectively address this question looking to uh, different uh, uh, patients. And in fact, in our database uh, uh, some years ago, we looked to the patient who have received the RIC, as I've already uh, described, and what we call now the low toxicity regimen with three or four days of uh, busulfan. Of course, there was differences, uh, mainly uh, uh, patients who have received low toxicity uh, regimen were uh, younger, but there was no difference in terms of donor or uh, disease. What we have seen in this uh, retrospective study is that clearly reduced intensity conditioning regimen was associated with a lower non-relapse mortality. But once again, remember the age of the patient were not uh, the, uh, the same. And when we perform uh, multivariate analysis concerning uh, uh, the progression-free survival, you can see that the two ordinary parameters influencing the outcome is really the disease status and uh, uh, the uh, characteristic of the disease, but not the age or even the dose of busulfan. This means that very clearly we have in an area that where we can choose different parameters of the conditioning regimen according to the characteristic, at least, of the patient. Now, another question will, uh, would be uh, of uh, importance. It's to, it was retrospective study to know prospectively if there is a, a really uh, an importance. And in fact, we are around, uh, conducting a prospective clinical trial where we compared uh, for older patients above the age of 55, uh, three different regimen uh, 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 varying only on the dose of uh, busulfan, uh, two days of busulfan, three days of busulfan, or four days of busulfan. And we have already randomized 150 patients with this, uh, still 20 patients. And I do hope that after the pandemia we are faced uh, presently, uh, we will be able to conclude this study uh, rapidly uh, this year. And uh, I think this kind of uh, prospective study, studying really the dose intensity uh, with uh, chemotherapy, uh, may be of importance for the future. In the meantime, there have been already another study looking to the dose intensity, but with the TBI. It had been published by the German group, and uh, they have randomized nearly 200 patients uh, with uh, uh, a median age around 45, 44. 60% uh, of the patients were treated from a match sibling donor. And the results uh, show that there was no difference between the standard conditioning, which was a TBI above uh, 8 grays, and the reduced intensity with a TBI of 8 grays or less. So it was uh, something very interesting to see that, in fact, as you can see here, there was absolutely no difference in terms of relapse. Long-term follow-up for this study is important to see what will be uh, uh, the long-term outcome of this patient. So now we can move a little bit further and ask another question. The, f the other question would be, is there any difference between the low toxicity regime that we define uh, over the last slide and the standard myeloablative conditioning regime, which I will take now because it's used by many people, the busulfan and cyclophosphamide, full dose busulfan and 120 milligram of cyclophosphamide. In fact, uh, this question raises 
raised uh, uh, from the seminal work from uh, Borier Anderson uh, in Houston. Uh, uh, Borier is uh, the one who developed the IV form of uh, busulfan, and in a retrospective study, he showed very clearly that the use of busulfan and fludarabin. Uh, taking into account that you have to give uh, the busulfan and fludarabine in some uh, order was uh, very was better than the standard uh, buside too, and in fact this question was uh, prospectively addressed by uh, the Italian group who compared in fact buside and buflu uh, in a prospective study with uh, more than uh, 250 patients. As you can see here, median age of this patient is around 50. Uh, 45% of the patient received a uh, graph from match sibling daughter, and uh, uh, most of the patients was in, were AML in first complete, uh, complete remission. Now, when you look to the result, there was a lower uh, non-relapse uh, 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 mortality uh, for the patient who have received uh, uh, busulfan and fludarabine, and no difference in terms of relapse, which is, of course, very important. And this was uh, mainly due to the older patient uh, with an age um, above 51 uh, in terms of non-relapse mortality, uh, as you can see in this funnel plot. So the message of this uh, study seems to be very clear. Um, at least busulfan plus fludarabine is as good as busulfan plus cyclophosphamide without uh, uh, any impact on relapse. And probably in older patients, there is a benefit in terms of uh, toxicity. So now that we think that the result can be comparable between low toxicity and myelo abatibrigiban, another question raised up, and it's a comparison with reduced intensity conditioning regimen. And it's always the same question about the balance between toxicity and relapse. And in fact, these have been addressed in a prospective trial uh, performed in the US uh, when um, nearly uh, 280 patients have been randomized between a myeloablative or reduced toxicity conditioning regimen and reduced intensity conditioning regimen. Patients were a little bit older than the, what we talked about previously, and you can see that uh, decade per decade, uh, the median age of patient increased in a clinical trial. It was 80% AMLs and 20% uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, and you can see also that 50% uh, of the patient have a high risk or unknown risk in terms of uh, outcome. Uh, as you can see here, conditioning regimen for the myeloablative conditioning regimen were either the standard mark or the low toxicity conditioning regimen. And most of the patients with the RIC regimen received the standard fludarabine and uh, busulfan. Uh, you can see also that 20%, uh, 15% of the patients didn't receive any ATG in addition to the standard GVHD prophylaxis. In terms of uh, outcome, you can see uh, on this slide that uh, patients who have re pre been prepared by, by reduced intensity conditioning regimen has a really uh, a lower uh, transplantability uh, mortality. However, as you can see here, the relapse rate was much higher in the situation of uh, uh, for for both AML and myelodysplastic syndrome, conducting to a poor leukemia-free survival. So it's very intriguing because we have many data showing that it was not uh, uh, really uh, uh, the case, but very clearly it seems that for younger uh, uh, patient, it seems that myeloablative uh, uh, conditioning regimen. Uh, is something of, uh, of great uh, importance. However, you have to uh, see that, uh, uh, unfortunately, not all patients with myeloablative conditioning regimen uh, survive to this uh, treatment. And once again, it will be one of the issues I will address in the conclusion. The last paper, which is of importance, is to see if you 
look to the patient according to minimal residual disease, and it will, this was performed in this clinical trial with NGS, what is the impact of the conditioning regimen? So 190 patients have been uh, studied between Mark uh, and Rick, as you can see uh, here. The patient were uh, AML or uh, uh, MDS, but basically it was AML uh, uh, developing after uh, MDS when MDS was noted. Uh, you will see the characteristic of the disease on the second table. Um, uh, half of the patient receive a related uh, transplant. And once again, conditioning regimen was uh, uh, mainly based on busulfan and fludarabine or busulfan cyclophosphamide uh, for uh, myeloablative regimen and flubu2 for the condition. The, um, uh, reduced intensity conditioning regimen, and 80% of the patients didn't receive uh, any ATG. When you look to the result, very clearly, the patients who have received um, reduced intensity conditioning regimen here and here have a higher relapse rate than the, the, uh, the other one. Uh, but the uh, main difference is between the patient who have been NGS positive prior to transplant, and uh, we have received either Rick here or uh, either Mark uh, here. You have to notice again, as I said uh, just previously, that however, nearly 20% of the patient with myeloablative condition regimen still relapse. Now, when you looked in a multivariate analysis uh, on relapse, it seemed very clear that there is a difference for uh, uh, the impact of the dose intensity uh, in the situation of positive NGS, but no importance in the situation of negative NGS, uh, uh, trying to look to the disease prior to transplant. Um, when you look very clearly here, the outcome of this patient, you can see the difference and the worst scenario being uh, to receive a reduced intensity conditioning regimen. Uh, uh, in the situation of positive uh, minimal residual disease. So very clearly, uh, it seems that in this situation, uh, myeloablative conditioning regimen uh, seems of more importance. However, once again, we are faced to the uh, probability of transplant-related mortality, which is higher in the situation of myeloablative conditioning regimen. So, in first conclusion, we said that dose intensity plays a real role in disease control. There is no doubt about that, and this has to be considered. But there are several drawbacks with intense conditioning regimen. And uh, the three main ones are, is the fact that, first, we didn't cure all patients. We didn't eradicate all disease using conditioning regimen, and we have to keep that in mind. Second, we have a higher rate of fatal and non-fatal toxicities uh, for the patient, and we cannot uh, apply to, uh, the conditioning regimen to many patients, notably older patients. Remember, and I don't know in your unit, but in my program, the median age of our patient is now 61, meaning that uh, intensive conditioning regimen is very difficult to deliver. And... Uh, of course, we have to ask the question, are we more interested in treating disease and curing patients? Obviously, these two parameters interact, but very clearly, our main goal is to cure patients. And if we ask the question this way, probably we, will, we may consider the objective in a different aspect. What are the strategies of improvement? We can try to improve the anti-tumoral efficacy of conditioning without increasing the uh, non-relapse mortality. We can perhaps also further decrease the toxicity of the reduced toxicity conditioning regimen. And we have to acknowledge that conditioning is only one variable of allotransplant. So let's see in a very few slides, in my last slides, uh, how we could do that. And I have no time to go through uh, uh, many details. How to further improve the efficacy? It's rather interesting to try to consider synergy between drugs rather than to add other drugs we will deliver more toxicity. And just two to example, for example, the, we use fludarabine in the regimen, 
uh, reduce intensity or reduce toxicity, but other uh, purine analogs are of importance. Uh, uh, Patrice Chevalier reported uh, recently a paper when he switched uh, fludarabine to clofarabine, showing that in this situation you have uh, can achieve a better uh, uh, disease control, conducting to a better uh, outcome. And uh, uh, Borgier and the Sun, once again, uh, have this very interesting trial where he combined chlorofluorabine and fludarabine, showing very well that uh, the outcome of the patient uh, has to be, uh, is better when you very uh, uh, nicely uh, uh, select the dose uh, of chlorofluorabine and fludarabine, showing that in this situation, you see uh, here with uh, a lower dose of rudarabine, higher dose of chlorofluorabine, you have a better outcome. So it's a way to improve uh, the result. Second possibility is to further decrease toxicity, probably to uh, uh, give deliver a better GVHD prophylaxis. I will not go through details, but as you have seen in many of the slides I've shown to you, ATG was not used. There is now good evidence showing that when you use ATG, you decrease the non-relapse mortality without impacting uh, the uh, uh, relapse uh, of the patient. And this meta-analysis uh, very clearly established these uh, uh, results. Uh, how to further decrease toxicity? Probably by using the drug we already use in a better way, and probably the pharmacokinetics is very important. Uh, Jaap Bollens, uh, at the time he was still in Utrecht, uh, developed this very interesting uh, data showing that the pharmacokinetic of uh, 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 ATG was associated with a better outcome, and you can define a better exposure, taking into account the number of lymphocytes you give uh, uh, to uh, the patient as at the time of ATG infusion. And you have the same kind of results uh, when you look to the pharmacokinetic of busulfan, once again developed by Borgia Anderson, showing that very clearly when you have a picky guide uh, a dose of busulfan, you achieve better results than the uh, a fixed uh, uh, one. And in my last slide, I think the importance is to acknowledge once again that conditioning regimen is not uh, the only parameter of transplantation. We know very well, very well that patient, disease, conditioning, donor, or other tools are very important. And I do think that conditioning regimen at the end of the day is only a platform to allow engraftment in order to de develop allogenic immunotherapy. And you can very well think about maintenance of uh, post-transplant immunotherapy because it is very important. In doing that, you will increase, uh, you will decrease the toxicity uh, or the overall toxicity of the procedure, and you will, you may increase the disease uh, control because you will give uh, a more important uh, treatment. But in order to do that, first the patient has to be alive and not to be uh, uh, killed by the conditioning regimen in the first week of transplantation. And second, you don't, the patient have not to uh, be faced to any organ damage, uh, damage uh, uh, forbidding to give this kind of treatment. So I do think to conclude that um, we have not yet solved all the problem with conditioning regimen. We are in a better situation uh, thinking that Really, we have the tools to improve the outcome of the patient. We have to take into account that the population is changing. We are facing more advanced disease and we are facing more of older patients than before. And these two parameters are really to be uh, taken into account. Thank you for our attention. Good morning, everybody. I am very happy to be here uh, to uh, do this presentation regarding the management of acute gravacesos disease during this great event uh, today. Uh, so here is my conflict of interest disclosure. 
So acute varicocele disease is one of the most important complications after allogenic hematopoietic cell transplantation, of course, apart from relapse. So this is very important to have an effective prevention of treatment for these uh, very severe complications. And the main issue is that this treatment may be at the expense of other problems, such as an increased risk of infection and also of relapse. This is a result from a retrospective study we performed in the single centers to highlight that acute glycosis so disease remains an important issue. As you can see here, when we uh, evaluate the evolution of the incidence of acute glycosis so disease over the last three decades, you see that the incidence of acute glycosis so disease remains stable, including for severe glycosis so disease, grade three to four, around 20%. Therefore, we really need uh, uh, more effective uh, and uh, to develop a more efficient uh, strategy to prevent and treat these complications. So, first we'll see the prophylaxis for gravacious disease, then we'll go to the treatment, first line treatment and second line treatment. So here, this is a prophylaxis. So the gold standard for gravacious disease prophylaxis remains the use of cyclosporin A combined with uh, methotrexate. And uh, we can also uh, use a combination of tacrolimus and methotrexate. And both these combinations are better compared to cyclosporin A alone. There is also some data that compare tacrolimus and methotrexate with cyclosporin A and methotrexate. Tacrolimus may be better, however, there is no strong data on in European countries. The gold standard remain in most centers the use of cyclosporin A and metroplexate, while in the US most centers use tacrolimus. There is also some team that evaluates the addition of prednisone, that is a standard treatment for gravacious host disease that was also evaluated for the uh, prophylaxis of gravacious host disease. As, as you can see here, there is no uh, benefit in the addition of prednisone with a similar cumulative incidence with cyclosporin A and metotrexate alone or combined with prednisone. And prednisone also add a lot of toxicity and infectious complications, so we don't need and we should not use it. There is also some uh, evaluation of the use of mycophenolate morphetil instead of methotrexate. In, in fact, methotrexate could be very toxic. There is a mucositis, there is also the cytopenia. And mycophenolate morphetil with a similar mechanism of action could be a very uh, interesting alternative to the uh, methotrexate. And in fact, both in the ablative and non ablative conditioning regimen setting, it was associated with the very low incidence of acute grad three to four gravitational source disease. It was confirmed in several studies, both uh, in study with mirablative conditioning regimens and reduced intensity conditioning regimens that compare the uh, use of cyclosporin A with methotrexate or mycophenate profetil. And as you can see here, when we look at the incidence of grade 2 to 4 gravacious source disease, there are no differences into uh, the uh, methotrexate and the mycophenate profetil groups. And there is no difference also on overall survival, both in mirablative conditioning regimens on reduced intensity conditioning regimens. One uh, other very important drug is also the use of ATG uh, as part of the conditioning regimens. This is a result of a, a meta-analysis uh, that evaluates several studies. As, as you can see here, it was associated with a significantly lower incidence of CV acute gravacious host disease, and there were no uh, adverse events uh, on oral survival, disease-free survival, on relapse. Uh, several uh, prospective phase three randomized study compare uh, ATG versus uh, no ATG. Uh, this is the first study performed in patients with unrated donor. This was a study published a long time ago, 10 years ago, and that was updated uh, in 2017. As, as you can see here, patients that receive ATG uh, at uh, freezing use at uh, 60 mg per kilo uh, total dose at the significantly lower incidence of severe gravacious 
cause disease, and uh, there is a trend toward a higher overall survival, and there is a significantly better TBHD free, relapse free survival. So, this was for meliorablative conditioning regimens on unrelated donors. Uh, when we look now also at a study, another randomized prospective phase three study that includes also reduced intensity conditioning regimens. This was this time rabbit ATG 4.5 mg per kilo versus no ATG. And there was uh, also a trend to a higher overall survival, and there was a significantly higher event free survival in patients that received uh, ATG on uh, IQ versus. So, this is, was one of the events. In patients that have uh, match related donors, there is uh, also some study that evaluate ATG versus no ATG. It was some lower doses compared to patients with an unrelated donors, phase three randomized trial. And as you can see here, there is a trend to a lower incidence of grade two to four on severe uh, acute versus no disease. Uh, incidence was lower, and when you look at the overall survival, there was no differences. However, when you look at the chronic GHD free was free survival, the uh, use of low doses of ATG was associated with a significantly uh, significant benefit for these patients. Uh, one uh, very important uh, drugs also is the use of post-transplant cyclophosphamide that have been used first uh, in patients with an aplo-identical donor. This was the groups uh, from uh, Baltimore's uh, when they used so, uh, two uh, days of uh, high-dosis cyclophosphamide, 50 mg per kilo per day. As, as you can see here, it was associated even in aplo-identical donor with a very low incidence of severe grade 3 to 4 acute wellness all disease. So uh, there was some comparison of uh, pastoral cyclophosphamide versus ATG for APRO donors, and uh, pastoral cyclophosphamide was associated uh, still with this very low incidence of CV acute versus all disease, low incidence of extensive chronic versus all disease, a trend for a higher overall survival on GBHD free relapse free survival. Based on uh, this very uh, promising result, PTCI was also evaluated in patients with mismatch unrelated donors. This was some work published last year in the blood uh, by uh, Dr. Batipaglia that uh, show uh, that uh, Pastoral cyclophosphamide uh, was associated with a significantly higher TBHD free relapse free survival uh, in patients with a mismatch unrelated donors on a very low incidence of GRAD 3 to 4 IQ versus so disease, 9% versus 98% in patients that received ATG, and this was statistically significant. For the match donors, uh, there was also uh, from the Baltimore groups a uh, prospective study that was performed to compare uh, PTCI on ATG in patients which related on unrelated match donors, and it was uh, PTCI alone, no uh, cyclosporin A, no metotrexat, no mycophenate mofetil, which uh, on the included 92 patients. As, as you can see here, it was associated with the low incidence of GRAP2 to 4 IQ versus disease, and more importantly, low incidence of grade 3 to 4 acute versus host disease. So it seems to be promising event of a single agent prophylaxis. This is another study. In this time, it was combined with mycophenolate, mofetil, and metotrix, or metotrexate on tacrolimus, uh, and it was much unrelated donors, and the use of pesticide was associated with a significantly lower uh, event-free uh, survival uh, with acute versus host disease uh, grade 3 to 4 or a great two to four IQ versus host disease. So in practice, for the first line treatment, uh, of the prophylaxis of gravis so disease, we in patients with the reduced intensity and reduced toxicity regimens, we recommend in match donors the use of uh, low doses of ATG, 5 mg per kilo total dose, plus cyclosporin A on mycophenolate morphetil for unrelated donors, and for aploidentical donors, the use of PT size, cyclosporin A on mycophenolate morphetil, and also for mismatch unrelated donors, we recommend these regimens. The, regarding the use of PT size for gravis so disease, Prophylaxis in a weak setting with match related donors and unrelated donors. There is an ongoing phase two clinical trial that compares ATG versus PTCI that is currently running in France, and we expect the first results next year.
For the first time treatment of acute varicose cell disease, so uh, the gold standard is the use of two milligram per kilo of uh, steroids. There is some comparison of the use of higher doses of steroids up to. 10 milligrams per kilo, there was no benefit into the survival, into the transplant related mortality, and it was even associated with more toxicity. So uh, we should not use higher doses of steroids above 2 milligrams per kilo. Uh, there is also uh, some uh, study that evaluates the use of lower doses of steroids to see if we have a good disease, a good control of acute disease with less toxicity. This was a retrospective study that included a lot of patients, more than 700. As, as you can see here, it uh, seems to there is a trend to have a lower non rash mortality with lower doses of steroids, probably because we have light side effects and infectious complications. And uh, there is also uh, no differences in oral survival. Survival, right? It seems to be a trend with for higher level survival with lower doses of steroids. So uh, there is a randomized phase three study that uh, evaluates the use of lower doses of steroid, and uh, there was two groups of GDD, some patients that are really a mild gravascular so disease. So it was grade two A with patients with no uh, hypergastrointestinal symptoms, a rash less than fifty percent, no liver involvement, and as you can see here, the use of lower doses of steroid was. Uh, associated with a similar overall survival, and there was no uh, requirement for a second line of treatment. In contrast with patients with more severe gross disease, with rash skin uh, above 50% or stool diarrhea above one liter per day, you can see here that a lot of patients, around 40%, will, uh, 41%, will need a second line of immunosuppressive therapy. So it seems to be less effective to use uh, lower doses of steroids in those patients. So how we can improve acute gravascular so disease first line treatment? Uh, can we use something else combined with this uh, dose of uh, steroids, two milligrams per kilo per day? And this was a kind of the PIC, the winner trial that he evaluates steroids with mycofenate morphetil, deniloquin, pantostatin, and etanercept. As, as you can see here, there seems to be a promising result with the use of mycofenate morphetil. So based on this result, they go for a Perspective randomized phase three trial that compare mycofenate morphetil or placebo combined with steroids for the first line treatment of gravascular cell disease and results were disappointing uh, with no benefit into the response rate and no benefit on overall survival. On mycofenate morphetil is not effective for the first line treatment of gravascular cell disease for GDHD. And this is all this also highlight that this is always important to perform prospective randomized study to confirm the result that we can have some, some retrospective study or some uh, phase one or two study with uh, a small number of patients. So in practice, for the stage one, acute gravascular disease, uh, on two, with uh, skin involvement, we will use topical steroids, and with no improvement, we use low doses of steroids, one milligram per kilo per day. For patients with grade two acute gravascular disease, so depending on the stool and skin involvement, as we have seen earlier, we use one or two milligrams per kilo per day. And for patients with severe grade three to four acute gravascular disease, we need to use those dose of uh, two milligrams per kilo per day of steroids. And this is uh, very important to have some good supportive care, we'll say a word later. We will evaluate the efficacy after three to seven days. We will evaluate at three days to see if the patient there is a worsening of gravascular disease and after seven days also. Uh, there is a complete response rate in uh, around 50% of patients and we we'll define the steroid refractory acute gravascular disease with patients that will have a worsening of the disease after three days of steroids. If there is a stable disease at seven days or in patients that have an incomplete response after two weeks of treatments. So regarding the second line of treatment, so we say that around 50% of patients will be uh, will need a second line of treatment. Uh, there will be steroid refractory. Until very recently, there was no standard second line treatment. However, and you probably heard on read uh, this uh, trial that has just been published regarding the use of rixolitinib 
for the second line treatment, and we will discuss this study uh, in a few minutes. So, so far there was so, so very few. Uh, there is a lot of uh, drugs that were evaluated as second line treatment, but some very disappointing results with uh, ATG, uh, anti TNF alpha, mycophenac mofetil, alentuzumab, uh, metoprexate, and with all the study, we have some uh, response rate between zero percent on up to 50, 55 percent at best, and with a very low. Uh, overall survival uh, at uh, six months. Um, one uh, of the most interesting was maybe the use of ECP because it was not very uh, toxic, and less immunosuppressive, and is associated with less side effect in the patient in terms of infectious complication. As, as you can see here, into this uh, retrospective analysis of 128 patients, we have a uh, 56% overall survival uh, at four years, that, that is good, and a treatment failure free survival of 77% at six months, so it was quite uh, promising. Uh, another very promising one was the use of ruxolitinib. Uh, it was a preliminary retrospective report by uh, Professor Zaiser in 2015 in leukemia. And in this report, there was both chronic and acute versus all disease, but we will focus on acute versus all disease with 54% uh, with 54 uh, patients, all were severe versus all disease, grade 3 to 4. Overall response rate was 81% and the CR rate was 46%. And as around 7% of the GVG are going to relapse, and the six month of survival was high. 79% of patients or patients with steroid refractory versus all disease on the main side effect was cytopenia and uh, CMV reactivation, not CMV disease. So based on this prospect, uh, very promising result, they perform a prospective phase 2 trial to evaluate oxolitinib that includes 71, uh, 71 patients. It was published very recently by Professor Jacasia in blood, and it was uh, associated with a good overall survival that was higher in patients with grade 2 versus disease compared to a severe versus disease, and the overall response rate was 55% at day 28, with 27% of patients in complete response, and very importantly, it was associated with the quick steroid residue. Uh, next, they also perform a randomized prospective phase 3 trial to evaluate proxoritinib versus the best available treatment. They included more than 300 patients. It was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine by Professor Dreyser also uh, one month ago. And as you can see here, it was as the use of proxoritinib was associated with a significantly higher overall response rate, both at day 28 and day 20. 56, and it reached a 62% uh, overall response rate with almost 30% of patients that were in complete response. Uh, when we look at the impact of failure free survival that were defined at relapse of progressions of the underlying disease, non relapse mortality, or uh, addition of a new therapy for acute versus disease, so that, that means that there is a failure of ruxolitinib. So, ruxolitinib was a significant significantly better compared to the control groups. However, there was no uh, benefits on the overall survival uh, at the moment. So, in practice, uh, for us now, uh, for steroid refractory acute versus all disease, oxolitinib seems to be the most effective drug with the re uh, result from a prospective phase 3 randomized trial. And oxolitinib is now FDA, FDA approved for these patients in the US. And uh, in Europe, we are still uh, waiting for uh, a uh, possible uh, approval from the EMA. Uh, there were also some alternatives. We can use ECP that can be very interesting in patients that uh, we are uh, kind of worried about cytopenia or CMB uh, disease that uh, we can have with oxolitinib. We can still discuss the use of microphenolate, uh, metoprexate, or other drugs according to the center's uh, policies. We must highlight that still around 40% of patients are still non-responding to ruxolitinib at day 28. So uh, we still have an unmet need for this patient and we need some innovative therapeutic strategy. Uh, 
One of them can come from the microbiota because, as you may know, uh, there is a lot of studies that uh, correlate microbiota with uh, outcome after allogenic stem cell transplantation, and in particular uh, with gravastus host disease. In this study, you can see here that patients that have a higher uh, microbiota diversity within the gut have a significantly lower cumulative incidence of gvhd reactive mortality, and uh, it seems to be associated to its uh, blousia uh, that is a cross regalis that is present in the stool. Uh, and based on these surprising results, there was some uh, team that performed some fecal microbiota transplantation to treat a steroid resistant acute cell disease. It was the first case report with four patients published in blood in 2016 on in a patient with very severe uh, gravacious host disease uh, with a lot of diarrhea, fecal incontinence. They performed a, a fecal microbiota transplantation. And uh, as you can see here, there was uh, modification into the patient microbiota, and there is uh, improvement of gravacious host disease, no uh, longer any diarrhea. They can decrease the steroids on patients because. Similarly, this patient will see two fecal microbiota transplantations, improvement of the very severe gravacious host disease, uh, modification in the microbiota, and decrease of the steroids. So, in uh, this uh, paper, there is about four patients, there is three patients that respond perfectly well to the uh, FNT. So, there were some different FNT studies in patients uh, with acute gravacious host disease, and in all these studies, they reported some high uh, complete response or partial response rate. And based on this study, there was a prospective randomized uh, prospective phase two study that is uh, ongoing to evaluate uh, FNT with three FNT one week apart uh, in uh, several European uh, centers. And uh, we don't have any results so far on the efficacy. However, regarding the safety in patients that receive steroids uh, after allogenic cell cell transplantation with a high risk of infectious complications, it seems to be very safe with very low uh, regulated uh, adverse events. Finally, supportive care is, care is very important. We need a good infection prophylaxis and treatment and a close monitoring. We uh, need a gut rest uh, for the patient to recover. We should use parenteral nutrition for uh, an improvement of uh, patient's uh, well-being. Skin care with uh, topical steroid, but also uh, other drugs, other treatment. Uh, so, to conclude, prophylaxis of acute gravacious host disease is continuously changing with the development of new treatment with ATG, pasoxone cyclophosphamide. Uh, first line treatment of gravacious host disease is still the same on days of steroids alone. So far, there is no other drugs that show a benefit to be combined with the steroids. Ruxolitinib appears to be the new standard for steroid refractory acute host disease. It's FDA approved, but around 40% of patients are still non responding to ruxolitinib and day 28. So there is the unmet need of rexoitinib resistant uh, acute gravacious host disease and we still need to develop new treatment on um, some innovative treatment such as fecal microbiota transplantations. So uh, I thank uh, all my colleagues and uh, I thank uh, you all. Uh, uh, thank you very much.